morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the first lecture in the 2012-13 Building Ecology, Science, and Technology Lecture Series, sponsored by Tremco Roofing. Uh, my name is Ted Kasich, and I'm a professor of building science at Daniels, and it's my privilege uh, to act as coordinator of this lecture series. Uh, for those of you who wish to obtain a certificate recognizing the two structured learning hours under the Ontario Association of Architects Continuing Education 2012-14 to 14 cycle, please fill out one of the yellow registration forms and drop it off here at the front after the lecture, after the lecture that is, for sure. We don't want to be disturbing the lecture. A, a digital uh, certificate will be emailed to the email address you provide on the form. And remember to print clearly because this is not a school of medicine or pharmacy, okay? I, I've really had to have some difficulty interpreting some of the email addresses and names, so I, I really do urge that. If you are not claiming the two-hour uh, structured learning credit, don't fill out the form and give it to us because it just takes time to process the form and the certificate and it won't be of any use to you. So uh, in that case, you can pass it off to somebody else. There's still a few at the front if you still haven't got one. At this time, I, I'd like to invite uh, Sean McCallum from uh, uh, Tremco Roofing to welcome everyone. Huh? Believe me, no reason to clap. Um, just uh, on behalf of uh, Tremco Roofing and Building Maintenance, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome, all to the, welcome you all to the uh, Building Ecology, Science and Technology Lecture Series. This is our uh, fourth year uh, as a sponsor, so I just wanted to thank uh, Dr. Ted Kessick for allowing us to be uh, part of this. It's uh, quite an honor to be involved in such a great series. I also want to uh, thank in advance Craig Applegath for uh, what promises to be a, a very interesting and educational uh, piece, of, uh, piece of information here. So um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Tremco Roofing and Building Maintenance uh, is a, uh, a roofing materials manufacturer here in Toronto. Uh, we run actually a zero landfill facility about 15 minutes north of here in Leaside. Um, so we're, we're quite proud of uh, our zero landfill manufacturing facility and we would welcome uh, anyone who's interested uh, to come on by for a tour at any time. We'd be happy to take you through. So um, please come and find me after, uh, after the lecture and, uh, and we'll chat. So thanks very much. Thanks, John. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight's lecture, Mr. Craig Applegath. Uh, I, I'm sure you've all had a chance to read about Craig's background on the poster for this lecture. So uh, instead, I think I'll take a moment to say that Craig is one of uh, the architecture profession's remarkable individuals who is interested in the big picture with an even bigger context of climate change and extreme meteorological events that will become the new business as usual for designers. I'm sure that based on last year's lecture, when we had David Phillips from Environment Canada come, he explained how climate change is going to change how we design our buildings and how we design especially our communities. So uh, with that thought in mind, uh, please join me in welcoming Craig Applegat. Thank you very much, Ted. Uh, the best lecture series, Building Ecology, Science and Technology, um, is, uh, I think, a really, really important um, piece of our, our cultural fabric in Toronto. And, but for me personally, uh, doing this, this presentation, this lecture, is a bit of a homecoming um, because Building Ecology, Science and Technology sort of sums up my life. I started as a biologist at U of T. I did a BSc in science um, and biology, uh, specializing in ecology, and got to a point in third year where I said, oh my goodness, this is all about understanding, but there's no way to change the world. So how, do I, how can I get into a, um, a discipline or a profession where I can make some change in the world? And I was also very interested in design, so somehow I found myself in in architecture, and actually the way I found myself in architecture is I bumped into a, um, a high school classmate of mine. She was a VP on um, the um, uh, school council, and I don't think I'd made it up to VP yet. Her name was Bridget Shim. And uh, I bumped into her and said, Bridget, what are you doing? And she said, well, I'm, I'm doing this thing called architecture. It's first year, and we're doing these really amazing sort of ecological structures in the desert. I thought, oh, that sounds cool. So that started me down the path of architecture. Went to Dalhousie, 
uh, for my uh, undergraduate in architecture. And then I wanted to look at the bigger picture uh, because it, it was about just buildings and the city um, scale also attracted me. So I worked in Germany for a year for an architect named Ohm Ungers. And uh, af after that experience, I thought, well, I really want to get a bigger picture. So then I went down to the GSD at Harvard to do a master's in um, urban design. So that sort of was my schooling career and it's taken me, I think I've been in practice for somewhere over 25 years. I don't feel that much older, but I am, gray hair. Um, and it's taken me that long to take my career from architecture, urban design, back into relating it all to ecology uh, and science. And so tonight, this, this presentation um, is really about that, that circle. Um, and uh, I, I've, I've done this presentation once before, just a couple weeks ago in China at the Smart Cities Conference, um, but they only gave me 20 minutes to do it. So you, you've got, you get a few more examples, and I hope not too many, because no one likes to, my, my wife says, 20 minutes is all you should be talking. No one wants to hear you talk any longer than that. Um, but I said, they're architects. They're listening, willing to put up with a lot. So she said, I don't care what they are. Anyway, so, so I'm going to start off with a, a few questions. First of all, um, I'm hoping you'd be willing to put your hands up um, to answer yay um, to the following questions if you um, think they represent you. Um, how many of you are concerned um, about climate change? Okay. That looks like just about the majority. So how about this one? How many are of you are somewhat skeptical about climate change. Okay, there's one, two, three, four, four people. How many of you are worried that climate change will have serious negative impacts on our cities? Okay, about the same number. How many of you are actually getting a bit scared about climate change and maybe even think it's too late or hopeless? Uh, Looks like about 20. So uh, what's my point of view on this? I have a sense now of, of where you're coming from, and I think you should know where I'm coming from on this question. Um, I don't think it's hopeless. I know that James Lovelock has said the, the game is over, we're cooked. You know, there's only going to be 200 million of us left in the, after you know, the end of the century, somewhere up in the polls somewhere. Um, I think he's lately recanted on that. Uh, but I actually think it's hubris to make those kind of predictions. Uh, we just don't know enough about how the natural world works to know that it's absolutely <coughs> an end game now. We do know that we are approaching or have gone over the line where there will be no consequences. We're starting to see the consequences right now of climate change. It's not something, when I started talking about climate change in 2001, I was one of these weird wonky geeks that was talking about this thing called climate change in architecture and it was a really a oddball thing to do. And it was something we talked about happening in the future, future impacts of, of climate change. Last week we saw one of the big impacts of climate change, which was Sandy. So I don't think it's hopeless. I think that it's our job though to figure out what we can do to maybe pull back from this end game. And that's what I'm going to talk to you a bit about tonight. Um, this quote from Barack Obama is lovely. Uh, change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Um, we are the change that we seek. And I think this is particularly relevant to us, architects, engineers, planners, because we have such impact on the way we live as a species. We've, we form the vessels in which our culture exists. We have huge impact. So um, before I, I, I present the ideas about symbiotic cities, I'd like to frame it. And I'd like to frame it by talking about how um, we have gone from a, a few years ago where sustainability, they're talking about green sustainability, was all about talking about our impact as a species on the planet and what we were doing, the kind of harm we were causing the planet, um, to a discussion now just emerging about what the planet is now visiting upon us as retribution for what we have done. 
And I think that's pretty clear from what happened last week with Hurricane Sandy. Um, although people argue it's just another random freak storm, et cetera, actually the number of storms and intensity of storms has been going up significantly. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. Um, so I think the, the dialogue now must be um, for architects, planners, engineers about not only the kind of pulling back from the harm we're doing to the planet, but actually understanding and um, coming to terms with and dealing with how we're going to build more resilient cities, communities, um, to deal with the kind of impacts, the shocks and stresses that are going to um, be coming at us in the future. So, simple question, what can we do as architects, planners, and engineers? What, 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 what is it that, that we can do to be on um, uh, the side of positive change? So, um, for the last four or five years, um, our practice dialogue has been um, asking ourselves that same question, experimenting with um, uh, looking at resilience and looking at uh, green buildings. Um, and last year, in November, just around this time, um, we looked at bringing together um, planners, architects, and engineers from across Canada, actually the next generation of planners, the brightest young planners and architects and engineers from across the country into a workshop to look at how we might make our cities more resilient. Um, and this was a, a one-day Saturday event. We, we started in the morning um, uh, by asking ourselves, how might we design our cities to be more sustainable and more resilient in the face of rapidly accelerating global climate change? Um, and there were four concerns that animated our discussions that day. The first one is um, the one of, of course, increasing global temperatures and the implications that would have. The second one um, is severe weather events and their increase in both frequency and in intensity. And I'm just going to wander over here and point out to you that this, is, this graph from the World Watch Institute based on Munich Re, Munich Re Insurance, um, information um, really chronicles the increase in the number of severe weather events, that like category five hurricanes and tornadoes and so forth, cyclones, um, since 1980. And this is actually when I went into university here. And this is, this my, this is sort of the, my career. 1984, uh, graduate from architecture school, and then 1987 from grad school. And a, as time went, went on, Here's where we are, 40-fold increase, or a four-fold, 10-fold increase from, from four up to 40. Uh, that's significant. And so this, this um, phenomena was one of the key things that we were exploring. And of course, the next is um, the actual population growth of the planet over the next 25 years is somewhere in the order of two billion people. We're now at seven billion and we're gonna add, be adding another two billion people. And not only adding them, but people across the globe are migrating. There's what's called the third great migration happening right now uh, from rural um, accommodation to um, urban accommodation. And then the, the fourth thing is how we can actually implement change. It's one, one thing to talk about having change happen, how do you implement it? So, um, of course, the, the morning was all about exploring the issues. And then in the afternoon, um, we looked at actually prototyping some ideas about how we would build, build resilience into cities. And, there was, and prototyping is a great exercise in, in workshops. You actually develop a tool, and you design it, and you sort of test it. You don't just talk about an idea, you actually make a tool happen. So just a, there were four or five things. This is one of them. It was a prototype for asking political candidates, say municipal councillors, um, their views on various aspects that would reflect their understanding and willing to build resilience in their community. That was a cool idea. Um, another one was an information wiki where you would store information about building resilience that would be accessible. Um, another idea was um, a, a shock response um, uh, unit. And this would be a container that could be trained around anywhere on the continent and would have in it uh, uh, the ability to clean water, um, uh, basically taking uh, raw water, turning it into clean water, set it up, it could stay, whatever. So really cool ideas. What, what we did actually with one of the ideas, which was a toolkit, is we took 
um, a lot of the ideas that evolved and turned it into a toolkit for further workshops. And I have a couple in my, ba my bag if you're interested. So that was the first workshop we did last year at this time. And then this summer, um, we went a step further and we said, okay, all of the people that had been involved in the first um, workshop were quite interested in pushing further on ahead. And also, there'd been a number of events um, over the last year where people thought climate change is actually starting to have more impact um, than they thought, and the speed of change was happening at a, at a greater rate than people thought. They said, let's get together again. So this next workshop, workshop number two, um, was asking a big question, that is, we talk about um, the carbon city now, our, our, our existing cities and how they work, and we talk about how over time we're going to have to become um, regenerative cities, uh, and, and actually through what we build and design, regenerate and restore the damage that we've caused, at the same time as creating cities that are resilient to the shocks and stresses that are coming out of climate change um, and population growth. But what's the end state? Like, wh where are we actually going? These are pro this is an existing state carbon city. This is a sort of transitionary process, as is resilience. Resilience is ho holding the fort until help gets there. What, what's the end point? And I think that was, what is the end state? That was the big question. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about tonight. The workshop we held in Muskoka this past summer for three days was to look at the question, what would we need to do to become a symbiotic species? This is a bigger, bigger question than simply how do we pull back from climate change or how do we build resilience? It's how do we actually create a paradigm shift from what we are now as a parasitic species to being a symbiotic species. So currently, this is a, a photo of aphids. Um, and, and, and we saw ourselves, the starting point for the workshop is, um, we are now a species of pathological parasites. And pathological parasites, if you've studied any biology, you'll know are parasites that kill their host. And they manage to reproduce themselves and get onto other hosts and kill those other hosts. The only problem is, for us, we only have one host. There's no other host to go to. So I mean, how are we killing our host? Well, you know the drill, climate change, um, eutrophication of our oceans uh, because of fertilizer and runoff, uh, low density suburban sprawl, resource exploitation, soil exhaustion, deforestation, and of course, the pressures of ongoing increasing population. So how the question we asked ourselves was, how do we transition from being a parasitic species to a symbiotic species? Now, this is not hubris. This is a thought experiment. But it, it's a thought experiment in the context of oncoming despair. The oncoming despair of seeing a world that we love, a natural world that we love, um, be put in harm's way, in serious harm's way. So the, the weekend was the next generation, what, what I would call the um, zero carbon generation, looking forward into the future and saying, what will we do and how we will create it? So um, it, was a, it was a good weekend, a lot of discussion, a lot of discussion of the basic principles, and then, of course, with some very good local 100-mile um, um, radius food, um, we looked at developing the notion of what um, and how to create a symbiotic city. So the idea was that we could shift from being parasites um, to being symbionts by creating and living in symbiotic cities. So this is the only long definition that I'm going to force you to read and go through um, this evening, but it took us um, two and a half days to get to. Um, and basically, it, it was the final result that gives us sort of a road map that I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, so we arrived at the notion that a symbiotic city is a city that has a reciprocal and mutually beneficial relationships with its macro and micro ecosystems. It produces ecosystem services 
that are equal or greater than its net use of those services. The transition to a symbiotic city requires a cultural recognition that we are embedded in and dependent upon our ecosystems. A symbiotic city maximizes biodiversity, optimizes economic development, and enhances the quality of life. So the agenda for this evening is pretty simple. Um, why symbiotic cities? Uh, the five key attributes that we thought uh, were important to create them, or that they had if created. The seven strategies that we thought were very important for getting there. Uh, and a brief discussion of what it will take to get there and what we can do, what you can do now. So, why cities? Can we do can we do questions at the end? Wars are kept outside this whole process, I guess. What's that? War effect of the destruction of the wars kept all together from the city's life and the uh, evolution of the city. Let, let me come to that at the end. Okay. So why cities? Um, well, first of all, cities reduce our per capita ecological footprint. I, I think a lot of people misunderstand cities as being the cause of environmental degradation and, and, and problems. But interestingly, a biologist um, named Max Kleiber at the turn of the last century um, discovered that the metabolism of animals was related to their mass. And very, very small animals like mice had a very, very high metab metabolic rate. And very large animals like elephants had a very low metabolic rate. And the curve, um, the relationship between the two was an exponential, an, an inverse exponential curve, the square root of the square root. So that the smaller the, the mass, the higher the metabolic rate, and the larger the mass, the smaller the metabolic rate, inversely proportional. Um, a few years ago in the 90s, uh, a physicist in the United States by the name of uh, Jeffrey West I guess he had some extra grant money, um, was, was mapping Kleiber's um, rules onto other phenomena, and he decided, let's map it onto cities. And it turns out it maps exactly. So that the larger the city, the lower its metabolic rate per capita. Meaning that a city like Halifax consumes more energy, more roads, more pipes, more everything per person, per capita, than a city like New York City. The larger the city, the less, it's meta, less it consumes and the higher, sorry, the, the lower its metabolic rate. That's very important. So it means that creating populations in dense, large cities is a good environmental thing to do. Now, the other important reason why cities are a good way to reduce our impact on surrounding ecosystems is because density pulls people into the city or dense cities have, city, have people living at the centers of cities and the periphery is less harm as long as you don't have suburban development sprawling around the city. So here is a map, a GIS map, that shows the rate of carbon consumption per capita in various parts of the GTA. So orange is high rates of carbon consumption, and green is the lowest. So up, up here you have, you can see that scale. So right in the densest parts of Toronto here, you can see that per capita you have the lowest consumption of energy, and therefore the lowest production of carbon. So the denser your cities, the less per capita harm we are doing as a species to the planet. Now, the fact that you've got all this carbon being produced on the, the outskirts, that's something to take into consideration. Obviously, it's the densities, not the suburban sprawling cities that are good. So the second thing is 70 to 80 percent of the world's population will live in cities by 2050. Right now, just over 50 percent do in the world. So it's a good thing that cities, dense cities, have a, a lower harm rate or lower metabolic rate than 
um, smaller cities because we're going to be increasing both the size and the density of our cities over time. That's good. So this is a good starting point. If we did nothing else, we know that by creating larger cities and denser cities, we're doing good. So the question we asked ourselves that weekend was, how can we take this and leverage it? How can we make cities even better as, as ecological citizens? So how might we create a symbiotic city? So we figured that there were five attributes of a symbiotic city. And I'd like to go through those now. The first one is that the cities have balanced ecosystem services. And this was a really interesting one. And I think it's probably one of the most important notions that we um, explored. And the notion is that right now, cities draw tremendously on their surrounding regional environments. They draw hugely on the environmental services. Environmental services, when I, when I say that term, what it means is all of the things that we need to take from the environment to, to survive. For example, important environmental services that we need, water, oxygen, pollination, those kind of things that right now our economic system at the moment sees as free. But they are very, very important to all of, all of our economic and um, biological systems. So if a city is going to be symbiotic and not destroying its ecological system in which it exists, we have to start to develop cities and city systems that are actually in balance with their surrounding environment. So the idea would be that if the city is drawing in so many liters of water per hour or per day, that it is somehow putting back into the environment fresh water at that rate. Right now, we take water in and we spew it out. It goes in clean. It comes out dirty. Um, we don't think anything about it. Um, carbon dioxide. Whatever carbon dioxide we're putting out into the environment, we should be taking into the environment. So it's neutral. The same thing with nitrogen and oxygen and biota. The kind of, the kind of um, uh, biomass that we're taking in, we should be giving back. And, and, and although this, to many, would seem a pipe dream, there are ways to start thinking about designing um, the systems um, of our cities to work within this framework. Probably um, the most important starting point, the absolute prerequisite for having a symbiotic city is that it be a net zero economy. In other words, that it doesn't need fossil fuels to run. This is absolutely key because increasing population, even if it's producing less carbon per capita by being in a dense city, it's still producing carbon if we're um, in a fossil fuel economy. So somehow we have to get there. And I, and, and I have some ideas about how we can do that. So the current carbon reality, to give this some context, um, right now, the sustainable level for CO2 in the atmosphere is 300 parts per million, James Hansen's number. We are now, this year, somewhere around 390 parts per million. When I started talking about sustainability a few years ago, it was at uh, 387, and every, every year I watched it sort of tick up. Renewable energy uh, around the planet right now is around 10% um, of all energy production. Coal-fired generators account for 50 to 70%, um, and uh, the developing world is increasing their rate of CO2 production. They're not nowhere near North America's, but they're increasing. They want to be like us. Um, so the next, um, the third requirement is that we have non-toxic ecosystem support of urban fabric. And I think the best way of explaining this is to look to the Living Building Challenges Red List. These are the kind of chemicals that we have to figure out how not to pump into our environment. They're not only killing us, but they're, of course, killing the environment. So baseline. The fourth is a reduced physical and ecological footprint. We have to look at ways to make our, pull our cities back from harming their surrounding ecosystems. So it's one thing to have a very dense city. It's another to have a density at the core and this huge, sprawling urban fabric around it. We also have to look for ways that the systems and our economy are not extracting um, resources and, and in turn not producing resources back into the system. And we could do all this, but unless they were great places to live, we're not going to do them. We're not going to want to create them. 
So that's all very wonderful and grand and, and uh, out there in the future somewhere. So how might we actually go about creating symbiotic cities? What are we going to have to do? Um, there were seven strategies that we explored, and I think there are probably others, and there's different ways to slice and dice these. But these were the ones that were the sort of Pareto rule. Um, you do, these are the 20% that have 80% of the value. And the first and post, most important one was zero ca carbon energy economy. We've got, to, if we do nothing else, and if you take nothing else away from tonight, we have to figure out how to get to a zero carbon energy economy. If we can do that, then we can probably pull back from the brink of climate change. Symbiotic cities are not, we have to figure out how to do this. The good news is, there's actually a whole bunch of stuff happening right now that will give us the tools to do it. Whether or not we can pull back from our current be, being embedded in a fossil fuel economy is another thing, but we do have the tools to do it. So let me just talk a little bit about those. First of all, renewable energy. Um, we are getting really close to having zero carbon energy nearing net parity. Net parity means the cost per kilowatt hour being equivalent or less than the cost of coal production of energy. And we're somewhere in the order um, in solar PV of two to five years away. Um, we're almost there in solar thermal generation, depending on the part of the planet that you're in. Um, access to geothermal energy is available in many parts of the world today and has has various economic returns, but in some places getting close to net, um, to net parity. Um, biogas production as a, 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 from anaerobic digestion is now common around the world. And one of the big problems, of course, with renewable energy is the notion or the problem of it not being available when you need it. So right now in Germany, there are a couple of what are called combined power plants. And those are various pieces of renewable um, producing technologies integrated into a um, internet and storage um, systems so that you can create what's called base load. So the technology is there and the systems are there to do it. And I think probably one of the most promising, um, the most promising um, pieces of new technology, actually it's not new technology, it's just technology that hasn't been used for about 40 years, um, is thorium nuclear. Um, hands up, who have heard of thorium nuclear? One, two, three, about five or six, and the five or six are people from Dialogue. <laughs> um, so um, when I first started talking about nuclear, um, one of my colleagues said, you're going to go out as an environmentalist and talk about nuclear? Are you serious? Like, you can't do that, you know. Um, but I, I'd say right now, um, the risks of even regular nuclear compared to the risks of going over the edge of climate change, it, it trumps the concerns right now about nuclear. But there are real concerns about nuclear. But thorium nuclear, which is beginning to be explored and developed in a number of countries around the world, China, has got, this, this plant is in China right now, they're using can-do technology um, to run thorium. Thorium doesn't, can't melt down. Um, it can very, very, um, uh, it can't be very easily turned into a bomb. That's why they gave it up in the Manhattan Project. They couldn't make bombs out of it, but they could make electricity out of it. Um, and it's plentiful, it's as, um, easily accessible and common as lead. And it is everywhere. It's on every continent. It's very accessible. Um, and it's very, very efficient. So you can get it. It's safe. Um, what's, what's stopping us from doing it? Well, nothing is stopping us from doing it except what's called in the uh, IT community lock-in. You know, if we're using Microsoft right now and there's something better, it doesn't matter because everyone's using Microsoft or Apple. 
you can't go and use anything else because there's no platforms for it. Right now, we've got locked into uranium nuclear. Anyway, this is a, a, a fantastic opportunity for producing energy and doing so um, at net or below net parity. So say we've got our energy. So what do we have to do? We then have sources to run multimodal electric transportation. We can convert our transportation from being uh, um, uh, fueled with fossil fuels, um, so LRTs, cars. We can even start to look at all of our manufacturing that is now fueled with fossil fuels being transferred over to being fueled with electricity. Right now, a lot of these cost more um, per uh, production ton, but if you can get the cost of, of zero carbon power down, then all of a sudden it makes sense. So you can do electric manufacturing and recycling. That's a, that's a 1940s um, arc furnace um, uh, that produces steel. Um, we're going to, as architects, started, start to look at how we're going to be using electricity to co not only cool, but heat our buildings. Um, goodbye to natural gas. Uh, natural gas is a fossil fuel. It's better than oil, but it's still a fossil fuel. And then there's a fascinating thing happening right now called the Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things is at the, the um, uh, beginning of its life, but it's the notion that all things, all objects, will be connected together by an Internet. And the, the, one of the founders, the ARPNET founders, um, Vint Cerf, who is now a, a VP at Google, is really leading the charge on the Internet of Things. Um, and creating a whole set of new IP address technology. But basically it means that um, you, your clothes, various objects will be connected together by some sort of RFID, radio frequency identification devices. And that is a palm of a hand, that's a grain of rice on the right, and that's an RFID. An RFID is one of those devices you scan over and it will tell you what the object is, um, where it came from and the date, any information that's programmed into it. Um, right now, these are being transformed from just simply being response devices to being computational devices. So not too far down the road, things will be able to talk to one another. Someone said to me, well, what does that mean? And I said, I don't actually know. But who knew that the web was coming when the internet was put together just for email? No one had any clue. And when the internet first came out, um, and there was basic web, who knew that such a thing as Facebook would exist and have, what is it now, 800 million subscribers? So we don't know what's going to happen, but one of the things that we'll do is facilitate another type of internet, which is smart internets. And that is a connection of energy um, being produced and used in cities. So as we develop our aging infrastructure right now, we'll be looking at how to create um, internets where um, energy produced at one point in the day can be shipped to some other point, can be stored, it can be used and connected together with the same kind of technology that we use for um, internets right now. So the, the next really, really important piece of the puzzle is density. Mixed use, high density cities is what we should be aiming at. So all the condos you see going up in Toronto, when you hear someone complaining about the density, you're doing too many condos, et cetera, think twice about agreeing. If they're bad condos and without any really um, good at grade services, that's another thing. But the density itself is a really, really good thing for cities, as we've previously discussed. Um, in addition to density, how to grow density, I think transit-oriented design is going to be a really key um, uh, future. How to move out into what are now very low-density areas and increase density is probably going to happen most effectively um, and most easily um, using transit-oriented design. And of course, if you start to ask yourself, what's a minimum density um, that we should be looking at in cities? It's probably somewhere in the order, and we've had various discussions at Dialogue about what the right number is. But somewhere in the order, we think about 50 to 60 dwelling units per hectare. And that's the number um, that you see in Toronto for what are called the streetcar suburbs, everywhere from here up to about Lawrence, where um, streetcars got people to work. There were, weren't cars in the early 1900s. 
Um, and this was the kind of density that the private developers needed to support those streetcars and to, uh, to build them. So that's a, probably the minimum density that we're talking about. So the third strategy for creating a symbiotic city is urban food. So um, have any of you seen this before? Isn't this cute? This is the omelet, and this is a, a backyard chicken coop, sort of looks like a little pup tent for them, so you can lock them away from the raccoons and the coyotes in Toronto, I guess, um, at night. And I've given presentations all over North America, and I always show this picture, and I ask if that city is having um, a war at their municipal council level as to whether or not people can have chickens in their backyard. And Every single city I've spoken in has that war going on right now. Um, the problem with this, this is it's, we, we can give you, uh, I think it's an egg per day per chicken, unless it gets fouled up. Um, and the problem with it is it doesn't scale. It doesn't scale to produce a sustainable food supply for a community. The land required right now of typical farmland per person, depending on what scale of omnivore consumption is going on is around two acres per person. Well, for Toronto, that's six million acres. And that's assume you can, assuming you can produce food all year round. We can't in Toronto. And most of our farmland is now covered with um, suburban sprawl. So in order to get the kind of food supply that we're going to need, um, in order to not only be sustainable and resilient to future shocks and stresses, but also not to put the kind of pressure on surrounding ecosystems that we're putting on now with farming, is vertical food production, high-rise food production. And this is actually, the middle one is uh, Gord Graff, who's one of our interns, but he's actually, his other life is known, if you Google him, you'll find he's one of the leaders of the urban uh, vertical food movement in the world, interviewed um, by uh, Tree Hugger and so forth. And so here's a, here's a picture of his thesis project. This is a, a food terminal. The Toronto food terminal becomes the vertical farming food terminal. And the idea here is that it's a giant grow up. You're producing food, the vegetable food, um, in these long trays. And, and hydroponics is a technology that's been used successfully uh, since the um, end of the Second World where the Americans used it to feed all of their um, uh, Southeast Asian posted troops because there wasn't a, a food supply that they could count on. So it's very doable and the most important thing is it's up to 50 times more productive per square foot or square meter than typical farm. So, this what, what this kind of system has going on in it is um, the, the, uh, the, the hydroponic food trays which are being powered by uh, biodigestion down below, probably taken in from the, the city's sewage system and so forth. So there's a, there's a way of covering the cost of the energy for doing this. Um, add to this one more wrinkle, which is aquaponics, and that is a combination of fish aquaculture with growing uh, vegetable uh, a food content, and one of the key species here is, is tilapia. And that picture was an was a, uh, aquaponics operation in Alberta. Um, and you have an opportunity and a means of producing the kind of protein we need. Um, the fourth strategy is urban water recycling. Now, in Ontario, in Toronto, um, the way we do water recycling is we use fresh water, we pump it out of Lake Ontario, we clean it up a little bit, we pump it up to all our houses, we flush it down the toilet, um, and we sort of treat it, and then we dump it out into Lake Ontario and let nature treat it, and then we take it back in. Um, as the density of cities around the world increases, that kind of um, expectation of getting those kind of natural services it just won't be the sufficient. So we're going to have to start to use techniques of water filtration. Um, there just should not be wastewater anymore. We should be looking at how to filter it 
both uh, mechanically and biologically. Um, for example, in Singapore right now, this is called new water, made from used water, which is their um, sewage system goes into a processing plant and out comes bottled water. Um, they have this in California too, but they won't drink it. Uh, when you think of it though, that's what we're doing now. We put our sewage into Lake Ontario and Lake Ontario purifies it for us and we're happy to take it back in the end pipe um, and drink it. Um, biological um, purification has been around for a long time. One of the, the, the founding fathers of biological purification, John Todd, Dr. John Todd um, from Hamilton, um, has demonstrated that we can, with very, very simple biology, clean and polish water very simply. So we're going to be looking in our dense cities at very effective water um, uh, purification. And then I think a little closer to home for architects and engineers is infinite material and resource recycling. If we're going to reduce the impact we have as a species on our ecosystems that surround our cities, our regional ecosystems, and our, and our global ecosystems, we're going to have to get a handle on how we recycle the kind of materials we've already pulled out of the earth. And so I think for us, as architects specifically, they're mostly architects in the room here, a few engineers I can see, is we're going to be wanting to look at how to use materials that are infinitely recyclable. You can take them, you can take them back out of the buildings and recycle them again. So steel is infinitely recyclable. In fact, um, our structural engineer, Dari Kachi, was saying he didn't think you could buy steel now that didn't have some recycled steel content in it. Um, aluminum and glass is great. Glass, infinitely recyclable. Aluminum, infinitely recyclable. All you need is good, cheap, carbon-free energy. Um, I think one of the materials that we should be trying to minimize our use of is concrete. Um, concrete's a wonderful material to work with. Uh, as you can see in the Robarts here, the, the brutalist movement was totally in love with concrete. But even if you don't want to be a brutalist and do cast in place, which I don't think anyone can afford anymore, um, there's still going to be the use for foundations and so forth. But other than foundations, you can build buildings of steel and wood and not use concrete. Um, so steel, wood, glass, aluminum, and trying to pull back as much as possible on concrete. Because every single ton of cement that we produce generates a ton. Through, in the process, the chemical process that creates cement produces a ton of carbon dioxide. And I think we start, have to start to look at designing what um, Bill McDonough called eco-effective buildings. And, and to my way of looking at it, eco-effective buildings are not only buildings that are doing all the good things that we commonly come to understand as being green and sustainable, but they're actually infrastructure platforms for natural fauna and flora. We're designing buildings that not only have, uh, and that, that was a ideas competition that Dialog did, um, not only have green roofs, but have green walls. And these are going to be the um, ecosystem infrastructure for things like pollinators, for all sorts of insects that do various sorts of um, important ecosystem services for us that we tend not to see every day. The cities that we should be creating should not simply be barren of biota. They should be rich. And this is actually a a system by this company called Green, Green Screens. And I was chatting with the fellow on the phone the other day, and I said, I want a, a few of your really good pictures. Uh, and he said, this is a really good one because it's Staten Island, and this is just the day after Sandy. And he said, it protected the building. Not only did it um, do all this wonderful ecosystem service production, but the screen itself, that we're in front of all the windows, were protecting the building from flying debris. Now, granted, I'm sure something flying at 100 miles an hour might bash a window behind it, but you don't have that same kind of falling glass and so forth. So it, it actually produces another kind of benefit, which is resilience. Um, so another th um, uh, material possibility um, and opportunity is wood, because not only it, it, is it a, a great material for building with, it is great for sequestering carbon. If you fell a tree um, uh, in the wild, 
it will rot and release its, its carbon back into the atmosphere um, through um, a biological decomposition. But if you turn it into structure and protect it in the building, you've locked up that carbon. So over the next 10 to 20 years, as we're trying to pull carbon out of the atmosphere to bring down that, that, that right now 390 parts per million um, uh, of carbon in the atmosphere back down to 350, probably one of the most effective ways to do it is start growing a lot of trees. And taking those trees and sustainably harvesting them and turning them into wood structure. So and I think the reality is the symbiotic city of the future is also going to be one that has to be resilient to the kind of impact that current climate change is going to be throwing at it. And I'll give you an example. Um, what happens when this, this is actually a picture of um, Hurricane Katrina, um, or this slams into this. You know where this is? If you walk down to Front Street and you sort of shoot a west, that's a set of condos. I mean, they're all over the place now. And this is, this is window wall here and concrete floors. And if a hurricane, like Hurricane Hazel, hits that, they'll be lucky if they have as little damage as this. This is a Chase Bank in Houston after Hurricane Ike came through it. And if you're sort of thinking, well, you know, what is the chance of Hurricane Hazel hitting Toronto again or a tornado coming through, have a look at this graph. If you go on to, say, Wikipedia, and you just sort of put in all of the numbers here, and unfortunately the screens, you can't see the numbers on the left-hand side, but the bottom says zero and the top says 35. This is the number of tornadoes per year. If you go back to, to 1990, there were somewhere around one or two, and you can see them going up over the years, so that in 2009, there were somewhere in the order of like 32 tornadoes, big tornadoes in Ontario. This is Ontario. So there's no reason to think that Toronto is going to be somehow immune from a tornado coming through it. So what are we doing and how will we start to think about building the kind of physical um, building hardening and resilience for our buildings? Something that we as architects and planners are going to have to be um, taking seriously. And I, I think in addition to the, the notion of actual hardening towards weather events, we have to start thinking about something called integrated durability. And that is the fact our building systems, our wall systems and building envelopes are very complicated now. They're not like um, San Gimiano where they're really big, thick stone and the hurricane comes through, blows up a bit of glass and wood, and you repair the windows. Now, our, our, we have very complicated um, uh, building systems. And this is a graph that, that Ted Kessick put together a few years ago. And I think it's a really, really um, important um, uh, reminder that durability for a building is always based on the weakest link in the assembly. So that although you may have really good um, uh, panel system, aluminum panel system on the outside of the building, what's going on behind it? And every single piece of that assembly has to be understood as producing the overall outcome for durability. And then how do we do weather protection? I think uh, there, if you look at Florida, Florida is a really good example of how um, cities can prepare for the kind of uh, weather events that, that all cities are going to be experiencing in the future. Um, Dialogue was exploring one project and how we would provide screens that could be used uh, to screen balconies and so forth, um, and uh, at the same time um, provide weather protection. Very simple stuff. But I think probably one of the most powerful techniques is going to be the green screen, where in the summer the leaves um, uh, grow deciduously and give the, the building shade. In the winter they fall off, light comes in. But always they've got this screen in front of the building that actually also provides that kind of extra um, uh, protection from weather, and, and especially for flying debris. So those were the seven key things we thought that would be necessary to get to creating um, a symbiotic city. And then the question arises, what's it going to take to get there? I mean, is this pie in the sky? What do we need to do? And I think um, the five things that, that I, I think are starting points for getting there are as follows. First of all, we have to come to the sort of existential understanding that we only have one host. 
There's nowhere else to go. We can't kill it. We have to figure out a way as a species to get there. It's, it, we don't have a choice. It's going to be really hard, but it's the only path we can take. And if you look at what just transpired in the United States um, this past week, the election, um, and the fact that neither the Democrats nor the Republicans were really talking about climate change as having any relevance whatsoever, although Obama has just yesterday said that it's going to be on his radar. But the Republicans actually didn't believe it. They said it doesn't exist. So it's going to be very hard for societies, and they're not the only, the only country in the world that has this sort of cleavage between those that believe and those that don't believe. Um, but we're going to have to get uh, um, a hold on that and, and, and really start to understand that climate change is real. No one here has to be convinced. We took the poll at the beginning. Oh, well, actually, there's three or four people up there. Um, I think the third thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to get serious about zero carbon energy. Um, probably the most effective advocate in the world right now, I think, is Bill McKibben. He leads an organization called 350.org, the 350 standing for the 350 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere, which is sustainable. Um, and he has a campaign right now to take it to big oil to say, look, if you burn all of your reserves that you have, the planet is done. I think as a species, um, as a culture, we're going to have to come to terms with the fact that we have alternatives to fossil fuel. We somehow have to engage and figure out how to pull back from fossil fuel. Um, and a realization that there's no such thing as externalities. Right now, our economic system sees all the most important things that allow us to survive and live, like oxygen and water and pollination, as externalities. If any of you have studied any economics, you understand externalities are things that are not costed. They're not, they're not weighed in the balance of understanding how an economic transaction occurs. We have to actually start to understand and internalize in our cultural and economic systems this notion that there are no externalities. Environmental services must be priced and paid for. And I think that the next one, and it's getting harder and harder as I go, um, necessity um, of evidence-based policy in politics. This is probably the hardest one to get over. I mean, you listen to what's going on in Ottawa or Washington or China, and so much of politics is based not on real problem solving, but on politics. And this is, we're humans, we do this, but somehow we have to move more towards rational decision making and problem solving, and now we're architects and engineers and we tend to do this by nature, and away from ideology. That's a very, very hard thing to do, but somehow we're gonna have to get there. And so what can be done now? How can we make a difference? And um, I think one of the most important things to do is understanding, and what we did at the end of that workshop, because this is, as I said, a, a starting point, an exploration, is we said what we need to do is connect people that are interested in this as a starting point um, and connect them in a way that they can start to share their understandings and ideas. And um, has anyone seen this image before? Does anyone know what it is? No. This is an image of all the connections of Facebook users in the world. Um, and you can see that there's the United States and then there's a little bit of Canada on the top there because most of our cities are just along the American border. Um, and so we've set up a Facebook page called Symbiotic Cities and on that we're going to be putting um, out information, ideas, questions um, about how we can move towards creating symbiotic cities. And one of the things that's going to happen this spring is take this notion of a workshop larger and we're looking at in Toronto as well as in v Vancouver within a couple weeks apart um, putting on an unconference. Um, that is a very low cost conference for exploring how we're going to move from being a parasitic species to being a symbiotic species. And these conversations are happening and the subject of symbiotic cities, that Facebook page? Yes. So, um, uh, there is the uh, Facebook um, URL, if you're interested. And I'll finish off with this quote from 
Goethe. Thank you very much. Can I take any questions? Uh, it looks like a microphone is coming around. Is that the idea? Yeah. Um, Barry Klein, architect from Toronto. Um, you mentioned that um, more compressed cities is the way to go. Denser cities. Yeah. What about the psychological conflict with the people who live in them, who relate to them? Now you need more subways. Now you need more industrial, more places for them to work downtown. How do you uh, rationalize all this? So, d by the way, when, when he's asking the question, can everyone hear the question? I don't have to repeat it. Okay. Um, how do I rationalize um, living with more people around me? Uh, I just came back from China uh, a couple weeks ago, and um, the uh, question of how to make effective density is, is really um, uh, much further along in exploration in China than it is here. Uh, and actually, one of, the, one of my hosts said, you know, um, we've been to North American cities, and what we find so odd is how far apart people are willing to live. Um, and you, you know, people are so isolated from one another in the suburbs. Um, so I think part of our um, potential repulsion about uh, moving from a suburban lifestyle and a very um, uh, low density lifestyle to a denser lifestyle is one of habit. Um, that's one way to understand it. I'd say that um, having grown up uh, as a kid just north of Lawrence, and then spending most of the rest of my life when I wasn't around the world back at a route young in St. Clair, that I much prefer density where I can walk down the street to a restaurant to buy my food. I don't have to get in a car. I don't even have a car anymore. Um, and so it, it's just all of the kind of things that density produces, to my mind, are positives rather than negatives. Um, now, granted, there are certain things that come with it that need to be effectively managed. For example, subways, um, uh, LRTs, and, and, and reinvesting to get the kind of infrastructure to make complete communities and very livable communities. You can have really, really terrible, awful um, uh, existence in density. You can have terrible, awful existence in low density as well. So I think it's understanding what density requires of us as planners and architects to make complete, livable, enjoyable cities that people want to live in, um, as opposed to density is a problem, less density is, is, is less of a problem. I think density brings with it all sorts of wonderful amenities. Is that? I hear what you're saying, but I don't agree. <laughs> okay. So, so, so uh, this is. I'll, a, I'll give you an, an example. An, uh, I live in a 44 story condo building here in Toronto. Wonderful, I can walk downstairs and get a newspaper or whatever, but I can't wait to get into my sailboat. Um, do, do you sail in uh, Lake Ontario? Yes. And is, how far is your condo away from the lake? 50 That's pretty good. You know, I, I, I gotta tell you, I don't think many people are gonna feel that sorry for anyone that has a condo <laughs> and a sailboat and can walk like that far. Like, what you're telling me is you've got this amazing amenity, you can, and I'm not making fun of you. Like, this is a cool thing. Um, density means you can get from your condo to your sailboat if you're lucky enough to have a sailboat. If you don't have a sailboat and you're starting your, your career in a small bachelor, you can get down to a Starbucks. Or you can just stick down to hang out with people in your cohort, whereas if you're in the burbs, you have to drive there. So, that's, that's like... That's not what I hear you saying, that the average Joe should be in all buildings, say, like the Bronx. Um, well, uh, what, what I'm saying is we have to learn, oh, no, no, we actually know how to do good density. The best density, I think, right now in the world is Vancouver. Um, good um, street level amenities, three, four, five stories tall, and then towers set back so that you can see them on the horizon, but they're not right in your face. And you have a real sense of 
scale related, uh, hu human scale at street, and yet you have the kind of density to really provide um, the kind of ecological positive impact that you wouldn't have without that kind of density. Any other questions? Hi, sir. Um, my question uh, is very much building on this, uh, the question of density. Um, the short question is, is there an upper bound to density? Um, and my question is sort of framed from my experience working in Vancouver uh, on the leaky condo crisis. And uh, that really got me thinking about, um, are these high-rise towers made out of glass and concrete uh, really the symbiotic form for the city? Is there perhaps, um, we talked about minimum density, but is there perhaps minimum density? And is that really economically, environmentally, and socially feasible? Um, so I agree with that there's some need for density, but is it mid-rise, is it high-rise? Okay, so, Could it so be first of all, really good question. There are, there are a lot of um, uh, pieces in that question. Um, what I'm hearing is, um, first of all, are towers made of glass and concrete um, and leak a good thing? Um, second of all, what is the maximum range for density that makes sense? Um, and, and third, you know, how, how do you actually construe that density on a site uh, to make it workable? Um, first of all, uh, w when you hear the word density, it comes with a lot of um, bad press related to things that have happened in designs that are unsuccessful. And so the Vancouver <coughs> leaky condo um, uh, crisis is a good example of that. That's not about density being the problem because you could have had, you, by the way, it wasn't just density in Vancouver. There were leaky condos that were one, two, and three stories in Vancouver. In fact, uh, I think a lot of them were, had more problems than the taller ones. So that's a question of um, poorly detailed buildings and a regulatory environment that did not require developers to build um, high, high enough quality. Um, we are slaves to our client's um, economic situation. If the developer says, well, I all have, only have so many dollars a square foot that I can spend on the building wall, I can't afford curtain wall, I can only afford window wall, and everyone else is using it, you as an architect aren't going to get the job unless you use window wall, and window wall is a big problem when it comes to moisture penetration, right? So I think it's a issue of how do we deal with building code, how do we make the, uh, the building codes more effective in restricting the kind of construction practices that lead to problems. That's got nothing to do with climate change or symbiotic cities, that's got to do with good building. I think in terms of what you make it of, solid gla glazing um, is a big problem. Look at what happens when a hurricane hits. Yeah, that's a problem. So what do you do? Well, there are ways to shield it, to clad it, to screen it to produce uh, really good associated um, consequences like, you know, providing infrastructure for biota and ecosystems. So I think as architects, here's a wonderful opportunity. I mean, we are problem solvers and we're creative. And we can take, you know, the existing situation that, that, is, that is potentially a problem and see the opportunities in it and get to the new solution. So we should be looking at this as, wow, there are some really great opportunities. North American cities, all of their infrastructure is cacked. Like it's 60 to 100 years old and it needs refurbishment, renovation, restoration. Newer infrastructure is needed. Big problem, econ economic, all our governments are laden in debt. But as we develop, as we start to invest in our cities, and we will because they're going to grow and they're going to get denser uh, because of inward migration to Canada, we will have opportunities to develop that new infrastructure. Anything else? Um, yes. I think uh, one thing that might uh, clarify the first gentleman's question and respond a bit as well is that um, it might be contentious to bring up Jane Jacobs in, in this as, a, as an example, but it, it might be useful to remember her distinction between overcrowding and density and the idea of density being uh, the number of dwellings in a certain area, whereas overcrowding being the number of people within a dwelling. And that, with the density, as you suggest, we have all of these solutions. But with the overcrowding, we have all of these problems. So just remember that <laughs> distinction might be useful to point out as well. Yeah, I, I, again, um, 
density has many potential transformations. Um, that when I, f when I flew over Guangzhou, which is uh, just a small city of about 20 million people uh, in China, I was, uh, I'm not usually surprised by much anymore, but it really took my breath away because imagine a city that spread, that, that spanned from Hamilton to Barrie to Oshawa, sort of a, a circle like that, and at the center of the city was sort of something that looked like Toronto, like a bunch of high rises and stuff. But surrounding that, everywhere, was Jane Finch. Basically, towers in the park, Corb towers in the park, only there wasn't any park. There was just the towers, and they were really, really close together. So I couldn't even imagine, you just saw a shadow between them because no light was penetrating. They're like, that's overwhelmingly, horrendously terrible density. But um, actually, for a lot of the people living there, if you ask them, they say, it's wonderful because we were living in a rural situation, starving to death, didn't have any economic opportunities, and we got to go and live as a family in one room in this apartment. It was awesome. And so it's a very sort of experience of what density is very relative. And I think we're going to have to look at how to make good density because we have to do it. I mean, the, 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 the cliff out there is climate change, and density is one of the most powerful tools we have as architects and planners to deal with it. Any other questions? Hi. Uh, my question uh, is about timing and, and sequence because I think uh, those s uh, seven strategies that you outlined, from uh, which density was only one of them, and to get uh, bogged down on density in isolation, obviously is not going to be helpful. We need to uh, allow those other seven strategies to play their effective role in order to generate a, a, to a total result which uh, benefits from all those seven strategies. And one other thing is about density. Obviously, if you look at density in Calcutta, for example, where, where people are suffering because of overcrowding, but one of the attributes you mentioned, that uh, great uh, places to live, that attribute obviously is not present there. That's why the suffering uh, t uh, takes over as opposed to enjoyable life and stuff. So back to my question, is the timing, the sequence? Because those seven strategies are all important. It looks like that eloquently describe a recipe that can uh, hope, give us the hope that you were talking. So the, the, uh, I think that danger is that we're used to simplification. And we hear a bunch of stuff and we say, oh, density. I heard that uh, thing. Uh, and it's going to create this problem or that problem or it's going to solve our problem. And this is uh, uh, the situation that we're dealing. We are all trained in schools and educational system, which is based on simplification of the uh, complex uh, uh, problem. And I think that we need a new way to look at this thing and, and recognize that you have to uh, pursue all those seven uh, attributes yes. and seven okay. strategies. And yeah. so the timing and how you get one to go uh, forward uh, without the others, I mean, that's a very difficult uh, question. Yeah, I, I I, the question of sequence and timing and, and integration is an important one. And let, let me reiterate, because I, um, I, I think some of you, I'm between you and your dinner, um, uh, is that the, this is a thought experiment. Um, and it is trying to think about a new way of looking at a current problem in a different way, finding a new paradigm for understanding how we move forward. And all of those seven strategies are strategies that we, as planners and architects and engineers, live. There are other strategies that obviously have to be explored, but these are the ones that we really have through our skills, our training, our expertise, the ability to add value to, and the opportunity to use our creative abilities. And, and by the way, architects and engineers and planners have incredible powers of creativity from all of my experience in the last 25 years. Um, so what we do need is a framework of understanding, and that's what we were trying to do with this 
symbiotic city. So I, I, why don't I leave it at that? And thank you very much for your patience and coming out.